All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are ramping up for another exciting school year. And in September, we always like to work in some events looking at ocean plastics. So continuing on with that theme, we are really lucky today to have Dr. Imogen Knapper joining us from Plymouth in the United Kingdom. She's a marine scientist and National Geographic explorer. She's described as a plastic detective with her research investigating sources of plastic pollution in our environment. She shone a spotlight on microbeads and cosmetics, how plastic fibers come off clothes during washing, and whether biodegradable bags break down in the ocean. And now she's turned her attention beyond our planet Earth. She's investigating how our ocean debris knowledge can be used to influence action on orbital pollution from satellite debris. So let's bring Imogen in live with us right now. Here we go. Hey, Imogen, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. It's great to see you. It's great to have you live with us. We've got lots of classrooms with us. I already see classrooms saying hi in the chat. We've got Miss Sellers crew in Milton, Ontario. We have another group of middle schoolers in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, Hilson Avenue Public School in Ottawa, and then we have a bunch of classrooms in camera spots as well. So Imogen, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. Then we're going to play some Kahoot and do a little Q&A action. Perfect. Okay. I'll just share my screen. One second. Please shout if you can't see it in a second. All right. I see it coming in backstage and we are good. Perfect. Okay. So hi everyone. My name's Dr. Imogen Napper and I'm a marine scientist from the University of Plymouth, which is down in the south of the UK. And I'm really excited to chat to you today about being a plastic detective, how I got there, what I do in my career right now, and where I'm hoping to go in the future. So I've been best described as a plastic detective, and people have called me this because I'm looking at how plastic is getting into our environment. And most importantly, how we can stop it. And I'm sure many of you at school have seen plastic on the beach or near your homes or even near your school. So I wanna use science and research to investigate how can we stop this from getting in the environment. But how did I become a plastic detective? Well, this is me when I was about three years old with my dad. And we grew up in a small seaside town in the UK called Clevedon. Uh, looking at this picture here, this is the old Victorian pier, and I would often walk past this pier going to school or going to work. And the country, you might see some hills in the distance, that's actually the country of Wales, so we live in an estuary. Um, I used to love going to the beach, I still do, I still have this great connection to the ocean, and um, I think because of growing up there and smelling that salty air, dipping my toes into the water and also drawing in the sand. And now I'm also a big surfer where I spend a lot of my time actually going in, being thrown around the waves and really connecting with the ocean in that way. But my story of being a plastic detective also began from my love of the ocean, but also a question that I had about balloons. And this is me again when I was younger and uh, my baby brother had just been born, Alex, and I have a balloon tied around my, my wrist to celebrate. But when I was younger, I was about seven years old and I was in primary school. And I actually found this newspaper last night when I was having a look because my school held a charity balloon release. And if you can look really closely at the screen towards the left, you can see something called maypole dancing. Now maypole dancing in the UK is where we have um, a pole and it's covered with um, fabric and we dance around it. It's a, a very British thing to do. Uh, but we also held a charity balloon release uh, that for everyone in the school. We, it was a very small school, about 60 students, and we decided to release 60 balloons. And on the string of each balloon, there was a note saying if anyone had found the balloon to return it back so we could see how far the balloons had traveled. So it was a race. People could sponsor the balloons and see how far from our school in tiny Tickenham near Bristol they were going to fly. So the circle here is near where Bristol is, and we released our balloons. 
And I remember standing in the playground and hearing the countdown. So it went three, two, one. And I saw all of the balloons fly off into the sky. But I remember then going to see the results a couple of weeks later with my mum. And I was sat in the, the school assembly area. And what had happened is that some of the balloons made their way all the way to France. So they had flown all the way from Bristol, from my school, to France, crossing the ocean. I remember turning to my mum and saying, what was happening to the balloons that were dropping into the ocean itself? And then that sparked my curiosity. And I was able to then convert my love of the ocean and my curiosity of where's all of this rubbish going into a research career. So now I want you to join me as a plastic detective as we look at some of the research that I've done. So to be a plastic detective, we need to know the history of plastic. And plastic's actually a really new material. The first synthetic plastic, so the first human-made plastic, was created in 1907, so just over 100 years ago. And that was used to be a, a radio. It was called a Bakelite radio. And Bakelite was the name of the plastic as well. And on the bottom, you can see an infinity symbol. It almost looks like a, a number eight on its side. And that means that it's limitless. And the person that invented Bakelite could see how many amazing uses that Bakelite could have. It could be limitless. And then it created this explosion of plastic where we now make so much of it, but we haven't got the waste management to deal with it. And here's a picture in 1955 about 50 years after the, the first synthetic plastic was made. And people are throwing plastic in the air. It's so exciting. It's really going to reduce our household chores. It's going to create lots of cheap items. We're not going to have to work and clean up the dishes ever again. But see how much has changed our lives. And mostly, for the better, if you just look around the room that you're in, you'll see so much plastic. So I'm chatting to you through plastic components of my laptop. My clothes are plastic. Some of the chairs that I'm sat on are plastic. I've got a plastic fabric sofa over there. I have carpet on the floor, which is plastic. All of these cables keeping my laptop charged have plastic elements. So have a look around your classroom and see how much plastic you can see. But I want to understand how is this plastic that's in our homes and it provides so many benefits to us but how is it getting into our natural environment and making it a big mess? So when we think of the issues, we might think of sewage-related debris or lost fishing equipment. But I really wanted to investigate the plastic that was getting into our environment from ways we wouldn't typically consider. All the way from looking at micro beads and facial scrubs to fibres on Mount Everest to even space debris. So my first research looked at micro beads in cosmetics. And I actually have one of the products here. Hopefully you can see it in the camera and you can recognize it on the screen. This product is a facial scrub that inside it has lots of plastic bits. We wash our face, these plastic bits go down the drain and they're potentially through the sewage treatment works making a big plastic soup. Why do they put plastic in these products? Well, it's exfoliating. So it's meant to help get the dead skin off. But no one knew how much plastic could be in one bottle. So here's an experiment that I did, a really simple experiment, where we diluted all of the facial scrubs and then using that contraption to the left, we were able to um, dilute it and filter it through, leaving all of the sol solids on top of the filter paper. And this is what we found. So for all of the glass vials to the right of the bottle shows how much plastic was in each bottle. And we were able to find that three million could be in one bottle. So on a squirt in your hand, there could be thousands. But why was this exciting? Well, it gave power to the consumer like you and me that we have a choice and a voice in what we're buying. We can actually go to the supermarket and decide not to buy one of these and get a natural alternative instead. And then because the consumer had so much power and they were voicing how angry they were that there was plastic in their facial scrubs, then industry started to listen and they voluntarily removed microbeads from the products and then this research influenced a worldwide ban, banning microbeads in facial scrubs for the future. So I went back and tested the same products a couple of years later, and all of the microbeads had been removed. 
And it was an incredible feeling to know that research can have such a powerful push to create change. And you can do this exactly too. My next research project looked at washing our clothes because when our clothes are swishing and swirling around in the washing machine, tiny fibers can come off and then like the microbeads in the facial scrubs, potentially go that down the drain. So this was my partner in crime for quite a few months and we wanted to see how many fibers were coming off our clothes. So we tested different jumpers. We tested polyester, acrylic and polyester cotton blend. And we found that a huge amount of fibers can come off our clothes by clothes wash. So for acrylic, up to 700,000 fibers. Now imagine that for how many times you wash your clothes a week, a month, a year, and then multiply that for your street, your town, a city. This is millions of fibers potentially going into our environment. And it can look like a small ball like this. This led me to have quite a an uh, interesting new career with National Geographic where I was able to then get four washing machines rather than one washing machine. And I was able to look at how we can try and capture the fibers in the washing machine cycle. And we found that some inventions were up to 80% effective that we we're testing. So it could be the future of washing up our clothes that we have a filter in the washing machine to try and capture the fibers. So watch this space in the future. My next bit of research and probably some of the most controversial was looking at biodegradable plastic. Because when I think of plastic like this bottle I'm holding, if it was to say biodegradable, I would assume that it's going to disappear in the natural environment, just like this orange here. And we wanted to test that. We wanted to see if these biodegradable bags were disappearing in the environment. So you can see all of the bags at the top there. They were either marketed as biodegradable or compostable, apart from the one on the far right, which was just a normal carrier bag that we just used in our experiment um, to compare. We cut all of the plastic into strips to standardize it, because that's what we like to do in science, we like to standardize. And then I used a drumstick, some old garden netting and some fishing wire. And then I sewed them in these pouches. So these are being buried in the soil. And we put whole bags down there as well, because it's just easier to, to see. We left them hanging outside, and we also submerged them in the ocean. And what did we find? Well, we left them there for three years, the longest experiment I've ever done. We took samples every nine months. So do you think that these bags disappeared? So let's, let's take a look at the air samples. So these all went into tiny bits. Doesn't mean that it's breaking down and disappearing. It just means that it's fragmenting. And you could argue that's worse because these tiny bits are harder to pick up. Imagine trying to pick up this bottle or if this bottle had fragmented into tiny bits, it's far easier to pick up the bottle. So the ones in the soil, all of the bags, biodegradable or compostable, were still there. And how about the marine environment? And this one was really exciting because every time I went back, there was like a, a zoo of animals that had grown on uh, the structure that I was putting into the ocean. Lots of sea squirts and brittle starfish that you can see here. And all of the biodegradable bags were still there. The compostable one had disappeared. We're doing some more tests on that, but all of the biodegradable bags were still there. And this is the picture that made quite a lot of press. So this biodegradable bag has been in the ocean for three years, but it can still hold a full bag of shopping. And this was a heavy bag, it had bananas and beans and pasta. Now I'm not saying that biodegradable Plastics aren't a solution for the future, but they need really specific con conditions to break down, like high moisture and high heat that you'll only get really in an industrial composter. You're not gonna get that in the natural environment. So we're calling for better communication with consumers like you and me about how to use these products and whether they are gonna have any environmental advantage. So we've looked at plastic from facial scrubs, from washing our plastic clothes, and even from carrier bags. But now let's start looking in the environment. And I was incredibly lucky to join a National Geographic expedition to the Ganges River with this wonderful international team. And we did the whole Ganges River, all the way from site one at the bottom to the right, that is by the ocean in the Bay of Bengal, to site 10, which is in the mountains in the Himalayas. Why did we do the Ganges? Well, it provided a perfect case study for a major river system with lots of different rivers inputting into it. 
But it's no different to rivers in the UK, in the US, in Canada. It just provided the perfect case study. So here we are setting off our expedition, me and my friend Emily, and we're just fingers crossed that we haven't forgot any of our equipment. And then we joined this little ship here in the Bay of Bengal, which was our home for a couple of months. So let me introduce you to the different teams. And I think this is a, a really great way of saying or showing that plastic pollution is a very diverse problem. So you need lots of different ways of analyzing it. So we have the socioeconomic team. And this team was looking at people's perceptions of plastics, particularly the community members in those local communities, because this is their home, this is their area, so they'll best know how to make changes and what needs to be done. This is the land-based team, and these were looking at plastic on land and mismanaged landfill sites and trying to understand how is this plastic getting from the land potentially into the river. And then you have the team that I was in, the water team, and we were investigating water plastics throughout the whole Ganges. And we went out from the bigger boat into smaller boats every day, and we were getting a whole 3D picture. So how much is sinking down into the sediment, the mud of the river? How much is in the river itself? And then also how much is in the air? So here's me taking a sediment sample, and we're taking a water sample right here. And we predict from our research that 3 billion microplastics are emitted into the ocean from a river every day. That's 35,000 every second. So even as I've just said that sentence, that's more than 35,000 pieces of plastic going from the Ganges River potentially into the ocean. And we actually have some research coming out on the 20th of this month, the 20th of September, which is another research paper which compares all of the three environments I mentioned. So we've got the sediment, the water, and also the air. So watch this space because we have some really interesting results. So we've looked at how plastic's getting from our homes into the environment, how it's getting from rivers into the ocean. And now let's go higher where I was able to get some samples from Mount Everest with the National Geographic team that went out. This is just below the summit. So you can see the queue of people there and they're just about to get to the top. We took snow samples all the way from base camp to just below the summit. And we found plastic in every single snow sample. And it correlated with what people were wearing and uh, also the ropes of the climbers as well. But let's also go even higher. So something that I'm obsessed with at the moment is space debris. And I got inspired to do this by one of my favorite films called Wally, -E, which I hope that you all have watched. And if you haven't, please go and watch it. And there's a moment where all of the humans, they've damaged uh, planet Earth and they need to crash through into space and they crash through a sea of satellites. And ever since I saw that clip, I've been thinking, is this actually happening? So I've been looking up to space and I've been thinking about all of these satellites and it became aware to me that this is really similar to the ocean. Our ocean is filling up with plastic because we're not managing the waste. And now space is filling up with satellites because as well, we're not managing the waste. But there's so much we can learn from the oceans uh, because we've been polluting it for centuries when for space, we've only been polluting it for decades. So we can learn from our mistakes of the past. And they're actually incredibly similar. There'll be biological, chemical, and phys physical differences, but the marine environment and Earth's orbit is basically a giant space that we can put things. On the left, you can see the amount of plastic waste going into the ocean. But then on the right, you can see the amount we're putting into Earth's orbit. And you can see that there's a trend of just going up and up and up. So we need to manage all of this waste. And I took this screenshot last night. Um, so on the 12th of September um, is when it got last updated. And this is about how many satellites are in orbit. And satellites are incredibly useful because uh, they're allowing us to potentially talk through the internet. Uh, we get our weather predictions from satellites. We get our TV through satellites, pay for our bank cards, and see all of the changes on this planet. We actually use satellites an incredible amount. So that means we're putting more and more up into space, but we're not controlling how many are coming back down effectively. So there are 10,000 satellites still in space, which you can see, 
only eight thousands of these are still functioning and the way that they're going around the planet means that they can collide and if you look down at the bottom that means that we predict 130 million space debris items are up in space and it's continuously growing so like we have microplastics in the ocean now we're getting tiny bits of satellite in space that we're finding really difficult to remove that's a whirlwind of my journey of being a plastic detective. There's so much more to talk about, and I'd absolutely love to hear all of your questions. But I just wanted to finish on this, uh, this positive piece, which is everyone is a piece of the puzzle to make change, and everyone is needed. And this is an amazing piece of art that I did with some school children a few years ago, where we all took a piece of litter from the beach, and we put it together to make this wonderful artwork of an octopus. Thank you so much, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. All right, Imogen, thank you so much for a great presentation and taking us into the world of, of being a plastic detective and some of the amazing things that you have worked on and rightfully so gained some, some media attention, especially with those biodegradable bags. It's crazy, three years later, still hold a full bag of groceries. All right, well, what we're gonna do now is play a little Kahoot with our classroom. So while you were presenting, I pulled together a quick Kahoot quiz with some multiple choice questions and some true and false questions. So we're gonna see just how much our groups were paying attention. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get it front and center. And then uh, we're gonna play a little Kahoot. So here we go. So this should be loading up on your end now. And you need to go to kahoot.it. So kahoot.it will bring up this page and it will ask you for a PIN number. We have it up here on the screen, 550796. If you have one-to-one -one technology at your seat, like a Chromebook or a tablet, you can join there. If not, no big deal. Your teacher could pop this up at the front of the room and you can shout out your answers to him or her. If you're joining maybe from home, uh, and you have a tablet or a cell phone, you can scan that QR code and it's going to bring you right in. I can see we've already got our automatic generated names like the Space Ferret and the mm. Hero Dove and Captain Yeti. So we have students and classrooms joining right now. I believe I made five questions today. There's some true and false. There's some multiple choice. You have 20 seconds to get your answers in. If the answer is right, you're getting some points. If the answer is right and you do it really fast, you get even more points. If it's wrong and you throw that answer in lightning fast, we got nothing for you. Uh, you have to get that right answer. And the quicker you get it, the more points you're going to get. We still have students joining. So Imogen, while the students are joining, I'm going to ask you a question or two from the chat that have already come in. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first one here, Carmen is joining us. And Carmen would like to know, have you ever thought about writing a book about your story? Oh, that's a, a really nice question. Um, I haven't, I guess. I've, I've always been really focused on research, but I would not be opposed to do it in the, in the future. But I really love telling my story because I haven't had the, the most obvious career. I never knew I wanted to be a marine scientist when I was younger. But it took, for example, that, that story of the balloons and thinking about what's really passionate to me, like growing up in the ocean for it to become really obvious that that's what I wanted to, to study and make a change in. But would not be a post in the future for sure, for sharing my story. All right, another question here in the YouTube chat. Uh, this is a follow-up from Miss Lee's class. They're wondering, um, what is the most common object that, that you have found floating in the ocean? Hmm, the most common object. So I was recently doing some work in the Indian Ocean and we find a lot of flip-flops and a lot of bottles. And we, we find a lot of them because they're so buoyant. So they can sit on top of the ocean and they can be transported by the ocean currents and the wind. And then they land on our beaches. But we also find a lot of fishing-related debris. So this is some fishing-related uh, debris that I got from one of the beaches in Plymouth. And also loads of objects that we don't know where they've come from. So we've got lots of lids uh, and lots of fragments of plastic that could have come from anywhere because plastic is constantly breaking down and fragmenting like we showed um, with that plastic carrier bag that was outside the sunlight. Okay. We'll keep those questions coming in the chat. After the Kahoot, we're going to bring in our camera classrooms as well. But I think we are ready to go. So 
let's get this Kahoot going and let's see who places on our podium in those one, two, three spots. So our first question about how many plastic bits could be found in facial scrubs. Was it 100,000, 500,000, a million, or 3 million? So Imogen did mention a number about how many could be found. Was it 100,000, 500,000, a million, or up to 3 million? So you have five more seconds to get those answers locked in, and then we will see where we are. Ooh, couldn't fool this crew. Most went with 3 million, which means... The Agile Snail is holding down that top spot, but it's nice and early. So let's see what happens in our next question. So true and false one. Plastic is now banned from use in facial scrubs. Is that true or is that false? Plastic is now banned from use in facial scrubs. Lots of time to get in that answer. Remember, the quicker you can get that answer in, the more points are going to show up on that scoreboard for you. All right. That is true. Good job, crew. That didn't shake a lot of things up. The Agile Snail is still holding on strong. Let's see what happens in question three. So about how many fibers can come off a clothing item in one load? Was it around 200,000, around 700,000, around a million, or none? Trick question. We're trying to fool you. Nothing comes off. So is it 200,000, 700,000, million, or none? All right, a little more spread that time, but around 700,000. Let's jump to our scoreboard. There we go, a little movement. The Hero Dove has taken that top spot. True and false. After three years in the ocean, biodegradable bags had disappeared. So after Imogen's experiment, three years in the ocean, those biodegradable bags were gone, biodegraded, uh, and did exactly what they were supposed to do. True or false? All right, we know that was false. We saw that image there, uh, Imogen with the plastic bag and a full bag of groceries and that bag was still holding on strong. All right, final question, here we go. Where is the Ganges River? Is it in Australia, Vietnam, India, or the United Kingdom? So the Ganges River, where Imogen got to do a really cool Expedition, would you find that in Australia, Vietnam, India, or the United Kingdom? A couple more seconds. All right, good job, crew. It is in India. Let's see what that does to our podium. The Majestic Alpaca in third place. The Flying Deer in second. And holding on that top spot, what have happened here? The Hero Dove holding on. All right, very cool. Well, thanks for playing Kahoot with us. And now it's time to get into a little Q&A action. So I should be back from that screen share. Uh, I can see questions coming in via the chat, which is great. But we're going to jump into some camera questions first. And then we'll go back to the chat. So Mrs. Foster's crew, they're hanging out with us in Alabama. Let's bring them in first. Oh, oh, oh no. How are you doing today? Hi. There we go. Good to see you. Who's got a question for us? I do. Are there any experiments you are working on now? And if so, what are they? Mm, so I'm working on a couple of experiments, actually. So we're um, kind of in the early stages of our space debris research. So we're doing some experiments trying to understand how efficient different solutions could be to try and remove or stop space debris from happening. And then I'm also doing some work in the Indian Ocean. And we're trying to understand if we're taking all of this plastic waste, like these bottle caps, can we make them into other products that then could be sold? So you're making waste something useful again. So it can be used by the local community in these remote island nations that are getting a lot of waste. And could they potentially use them, a new product that's made for them to be useful or maybe even sell them on? So it's giving plastic waste a value again. All right, great question. I'm going to pop you guys full screen for a sec because I see on lots of those desks, we've got reusable yep. containers for your drinks. So that's really cool. That's definitely a, a good thing that you can do in your classroom. Uh, let's grab a second question. 
<laughs> I mean, I see they're hiding them now. Let's grab a second. <laughs> <laughs> I can come back too. We don't have to do a second. Oh, sorry. How do you dispose of microplastics properly? How do you dispose of microplastics properly? Well, there isn't a golden answer, I'm afraid. We can remove plastic from the ocean. We call it legacy plastics that are in there. Um, and we can try and recycle it. We can try and give it a new life. But what mostly happens is it just gets incinerated, which isn't good for global warming or uh, it gets put into a landfill. Um, but we argued that that's better than it being in the natural environment. At least it's in an enclosed space where that waste can be collected. So what's really important is making sure that we turn off the tap. So we stop plastic getting into the environment in the first place. All right, thanks Mrs. Foster's crew. We are gonna try and swing back your way. We'll see how the timing goes. We're gonna jump to another classroom now. Uh, Mrs. Ross's crew is hanging out with us. Where are they today? Mrs. Ross's crew is uh, Tavistock. All right, Ontario, let's bring them in. How are we doing, Ontario? Good. 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 Um, it could get stuck in its belly and not be bypassed through. So it's going to make it feel really full and it's not going to have any more food and get the nutrients it needs. So that's blocking it. That's a physical block. And also plastic can have some really nasty chemicals associated with it, like flame retardants or different colors. And these could potentially cause cancer or other adverse effects. So these are for the smaller bits of plastic and things from Plastic is always breaking down into smaller and smaller bits. And now there's a cause con for concern for nanoplastics. So they're so small, you can't even see them. And you're probably breathing them in or ingesting them the whole time. And it's been found to be in our bodies. So in our muscles, in our brain, in our hearts. We don't know what the impact of that is yet. It's not a cause for concern that you need to lie in bed uh, thinking about it at night because, um, We've been using plastic for years and years and years, but what we need to do now is stop it so that we can protect our environment and also ourselves. Thanks. Thanks. All right, great question. Do we have another one on deck or should we come back? Charlotte, do you wanna ask a question? I have a question. Charlotte has a question. Perfect. Uh, when did you start doing the science experiments? Hmm, for a job, I did. I guess I started when I was at university. But you can start science experiments at any age. And something that I've been doing recently is another piece of research I forgot to mention uh, is we have taken citizen scientists uh, throughout the UK. So we. Uh, recruited a hundred scientists that are just citizens and we asked them to do litter picks and record all of the litter over a six month period and we are now writing up that paper looking at the different trends and what they found and what quantity and if it was just me doing that research we wouldn't have that much data because it would just be me in Plymouth but by recruiting a hundred citizen scientists like you around the UK, we now have loads of data and we can see so many more trends and patterns. So if you're interested, definitely get involved with some citizen science and a great app to use is the Marine Debris Tracker where you can use your phone and you can download an app and you can walk down your street or go to your park or a beach and you can start recording data then and there, which is used by scientists. All right, thanks, Charlotte. Great question. Okay, I'm gonna go to another camera class and we'll take a few from YouTube and we'll come back to camera classes. So we're gonna go to some third and fourth graders in North Bay, Ontario. Let's bring them in front and center. Hey, North Bay. Hi, hello. My name is Caleb 
And my question was, uh, what did you do in school? What did I do in school? So in school, I loved the sciences. Uh, but again, like I said, I didn't fully know I wanted to go into marine science at that time. So I did a lot of thinking about what was passionate to me. Um, I also loved music. So I played the drum kit going through school. Going through school. And I did drama. I did French, but I'm not very really good at French. And I also did the, the standard ones that you have to do, like maths and English. But I, I'm actually not very really good at maths either. It takes me a lot of effort to understand maths. Um, but science and music was my favorite. Thank you. All right, great question. Let's snag another one if we don't have one. Um, I'm named Hudson Jinkra. I have one question. Have you ever went underwater for a science experiment? Once in a while, you're a diver. Yeah, so I did some work in the Caribbean in earlier this year, and I was really lucky to do some scuba diving to help friends that are coral scientists. We were going to different areas um, in the ocean, and we were trying to grow coral from areas that was previously dying. Um, and I've helped with some previous work before looking at how plastic can make coal very thick um, and how it thrives in more plastic-free environments. Thank you. All right. Thanks, North Bay. Great questions, third and fourth graders. Let's grab a few from YouTube. There's some great ones coming in on YouTube. So multiple classrooms, including Ms. Seller's class, are curious about, can you maybe list a few marine animals that are most affected or impacted by plastics and microplastics? Oh, gosh, you could argue all of them. But from the top of my head, um, it really depends on the size of plastic. So something that's this big might get impacted more by something that's a lot smaller or that's like more that longer and it can get tangled in it. So a microbead from a facial scrub could impact a plankton. But then huge fishing nets, which could be hundreds of meters wide, could entangle a whale. So it depends on the size of the animal and what the type of plastic is. All right. Another crew here is wondering, this is uh, from class 5-1. And so they're wondering a couple things. Do you ever see any technology in the ocean, like old cell phones or things like that? And then they're wondering, is it better is there any difference if you wash your clothes by hand versus a washing machine? So in terms of technology, not often. Every now and then I've um, had friends that have found like old cameras, uh, GoPros, maybe people that were diving. Um, but the amount of lost technology compared to plastic is quite minimal because plastic is literally so much of it. It's just washing up on our beaches on a daily basis. And then the, the next question was looking at hand washing our clothes. There's actually some research that we would love to do. Um, but what we have predicted, because in a washing machine where it's getting a very thorough wash, a mechanical wash, and it's being swished and swirled around in the washing machine for potentially an hour, then there'll be more fibers that come off. But we did do some research that shows if you put your clothes in a bag, there's a, a mesh bag called a guppy bag that's meant to stop the fibers being released. And we found that it was statistically significant in reducing the numbers of fibers coming off your clothes and going into the washing cycle. So there's different technologies that we can use as well to minimize it. All right, we'll grab one more question here from YouTube, then we'll go back to some of our camera classrooms. So Ms. Um, Dillon's class in Missouri are curious about how, just how small does microplastic break down and is there a point where it'll reach that it won't be dangerous to the environment? Good question. And one we're still trying to figure out. So if a plastic bottle goes into the ocean, then it's going to constantly be breaking down. It's going to be fragmenting because it's going to be exposed to the sunlight and that fragments it being tossed around by the waves. And that helps to fragment it. The, the salt of the ocean as well. And once it's fragmented, then it will go into a tiny fragment. But even that fragment can break down. And we're still doing lots of research to understand how small plastic can go. But we're limited by our scientific equipment. So we know that it goes down into nanoparticles, but they're really hard to work with because you can barely see them, if, if you can see them at all. 
Um, but my prediction is that they'll keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Do they completely disappear and go into the natural components of just carbon and hydrogen, which makes up plastic? We don't know yet uh, because plastic has only been made for a last, the last 100 years and it's been made to be so persistent. All right. Miss Collins crew, fourth, fifth graders in Fergus, we're ready for you. Uh, what's the farthest place you've traveled for work? Hmm. Question. India and Bangladesh for that expedition that I had. That was that we spent a lot of time out there. We spent about four to five months in total, and that was quite far away from the UK. Um, I spent a few months earlier this year in the Caribbean in a place called the Bahamas on a Lufra Island. And in less than a month, I'm actually flying out to New Zealand and I'm doing some research out there for a few months. Um, and I've never been to New Zealand and I'm, I'm really excited. So uh, it'll be New Zealand as of next month. Okay, thanks. Um, All right, go for it. All right, go for it. So how were you able to predict that there's so much plastic um, in the water and in space? So we know so, that there's so much plastic in the in the water because it's, it's so accessible. Um, in Plymouth, I can literally walk down maybe 15 minutes and I could go to the ocean and I could take some equipment. I could take a large bucket of water, I could filter it, take it back to the lab, and I can bet you that I'll find tiny plastic fibers uh, that have come off our clothes. Uh, because plastic pollution is really everywhere. We found it, like I said, on Mount Everest. We found it in the oceans. And it was from that film that I showed you, Wally, that it first opened my eyes that there's lots of sa satellites that are up in space. And we call Earth's orbit a global commons, which means that no nation, so the UK, the US, they don't own it. We own it collectively. But because we own it collectively, we haven't got collective rules of how we're going to look after that environment. So lots of people, lots of nations are just leaving their satellites up in space. They can potentially collide and make hundreds of thousands of bits that are moving so fast through orbit that we can't clear it. And there's so many similarities with what's going on in the ocean and what's happening up in space. And we're trying to use the research of what we know of the ocean to draw those conclusions together. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you. One more person hiding back there. Who's that question in? That question in. Um, what's the biggest thing you found in the ocean? Oh, this was actually recently, actually. Um, when I was working in an island in the Indian Ocean, we found this huge container. It was massive. I don't think I've ever seen anything so big. It was this big plastic container um, that had likely fallen off a ship. And there was no way I was going to be able to lift it up. It would have needed a crane. Uh, and it was really sad because it was on a turtle nesting beach in its most pristine location with palm trees and the sun was shining and the, the sea was so blue. But right in the center of the beach was this huge, big black container, which was a big eyesore. And it was really upsetting to see that on a small remote island, all of this huge bits of plastic were making its way there. All right. We have some sixth graders in Toronto, Ontario, waiting patiently. So let's get a couple questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's us. That is George Webster Elementary. Oh, <laughs> I look at the camera. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Hi, my name is Yasser and I'm in grade 6. And uh, my question is how was the north and south garbage wage created? The the north and south like the gyres like in the ocean? What do you mean by wage? Like, I think they are Place, like there are places in the ocean where there's just hundreds of garbage just piled up. Yes, so we call them gyres and they're parts of the ocean that have circular currents, basically circular patterns of wind. So imagine something similar to a, a whirlpool in a way that the plastic can get in there and then because of the circular currents, it can then gets trapped. 
So it just, it's like a magnet, it just keeps attracting all and all of this plastic that then most of it doesn't ever get removed. So it concentrates it all together. And it's because of these circular patterns. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Subhana, and I wanted to ask, uh, how are the microplastics in the products like created? Like, that's a really good question. So, a lot of people didn't know that our facial scrubs used to have plastic in. I, I didn't know, and I used to use these products. And the way that they're created is they'll take some plastic. So, if you were to look on the back of this uh, product, I don't, it'll probably be backwards, but you can see polyethylene. That's a yeah. certain type of polymer. And what they likely did is they got lots and lots of polyethylene material, and then they would shred it. And they would make it this really small, hard, gritty plastic, which then they would put into their facial scrubs. Oh, I see. Thank you. Um, Hi, um, my name is Maham, and I had a question. Um, so, you know how you went scuba diving? Did you see more plastic or uh, more sea creatures? I saw more sea creatures, which is good, but we're doing research to understand where does this plastic go? Because we know a lot of plastic is so buoyant that it will float on top of the ocean and then yeah. it'll get washed up onto beaches. But there's a big question because we know so much plastic goes into the ocean, but we can't find a lot of it. And we think a lot of this plastic is sinking and it's going all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and then it's going into the sediment. And then it's creating this huge mess of the sediment. And how is that going to affect animals that are benthic dwellers? And benthic dwelling animals are animals that live at the bottom of the ocean. They live in the sediment. Okay, thank you. All right, great questions. So let's have time for one more from YouTube here. Mr. Artie's class wants to know about uh, seafood. So what do we know about microplastics and seafood? Is there that's something we should be concerned about? Uh, so we know that plastic is being found in seafood uh, and it can go up the trophic levels. So for example, if a plankton was to eat a piece of plastic and then a fish was to eat that plankton, then that plastic can keep going up the food chain. Uh, I wouldn't have any major cause for concern because we're not often eating the stomach of an animal if we're eating fish. Um, it's more of a wider problem that even me sat here and there's plastic fibers falling off my clothes. I'm, I'm still breathing them in, they're going into my lungs. There's, there's other ways that plastics can get into our bodies. And um, we have a lot more research to do to understand what those risks are. All right. Well, I think that's what's so exciting about the ocean is there are so many exciting careers, so much research and things we need to figure out and discover from mapping the bottom of our ocean to looking at ocean plastic issues and the crazy amount of species still left to discover. So uh, Imogen, it was such a pleasure to have you with us today and to kind of, you know, we followed your career for a while in Exploring by Cedar Pan. So it's exciting to see how the next chapter is playing out and who knows, maybe you're going to have to leave the planet to, to study those uh, those bits <laughs> that we have in orbit. That would would never be <laughs> yeah. yeah, very cool. Well, classrooms, thank you so much for being with us today. Your questions were amazing as always. Thank you to the YouTube crew uh, for joining us. Thank you to our camera classrooms. I'm going to bring those classrooms in. If you want to get nice and loud for a moment, a big goodbye and thank you before we log off. Thanks so much for being with us, everybody. It was great to see you. Bye.